Hello everyone, I'm Philippa East, author of Little White Lies, um, which is a story about a family whose missing child um, is found alive and returns home uh, seven years after she was abducted. Um, I'm really excited to read you an extract from the book today um, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, it's a scene from quite early on in the novel and it's the moment where Abigail's mother Anne um, sees her daughter for the first time um, since she went missing uh, at the age of eight. In a puffy chair with a heart-shaped tea stain on the arm, my hand shaking, I tried to study the printed pages the detective had given us, one for me, one for Robert. Reunification, the pages said. Remain calm and speak in a soothing voice. Follow the child's lead. Don't assume he or she wishes to be touched straight away. She's already been interviewed and had a medical assessment, the detective was saying. So you'll be able to take her straight home. He was young and neat, D.S. McCarthy, Lincolnshire Police, brand new to the case and assigned at the request of the team down in London. It was completely irrational of me not to like him. There was nothing wrong with the way he looked or how he spoke and all the officers before had been so kind and understanding. And yet every time his grey eyes gazed at me, all I could think was, you don't know the slightest thing about me. Will that be all right, he said. We've assumed you're ready for that. I forced myself to hold my gaze steady. I'd done my best to make the house look perfect, prepared her room and put framed pictures of her everywhere. But now I thought, what does it matter how neat the couch cushions are, or whether or not I've hoovered the stairs? If a bomb is about to go off, what good will any of that do? Yes, said Robert, my husband, we're ready. The clock on the wall read twenty past ten. The detective reordered the notes in his lap, as though all the answers about Abigail were in there. I pressed my wrists against the rough chair arms. I didn't want him to talk about my daughter. I wanted to tell him myself. She's mine and she's perfect and I've loved her from even before she was born and I've loved her exactly like that ever since. But what about the man who had her? I asked the detective. Where is he? It sounded as though I was accusing him but it was only because his grey eyes kept fixing on me or on Robert as though he was peering into every corner of our lives. The clock on the wall ticked, 25 past 10. D.S. McCarthy shook his head. We're looking, but we haven't found him yet. A car crunched on the wet gravel outside. Now, said the detective, they're here. When the door of the victim's suite opened, we all stood up. I was still holding Abigail's Flopsy, the little toy rabbit she'd so adored as a child and I had to draw on all my strength to stand there and just keep holding it out for her so she would know it was us and that we loved her. Finally, here and now was my chance to put right everything that had happened and if I could do that, then nothing else would matter but that she was home, rescued and safe and everything else could be forgiven. They came down the long aisle of the room. The female officer escorting her had such a kindly face and then next to her, my daughter. Robert reached for my hand, and I knew he was shocked too at the sight of her. She looked so different. All these years I'd pictured her golden skin, her plaited blonde hair. Instead, now her hair was dull and ragged, and her face was so pale that all her freckles had gone. Our family trademark completely disappeared. Now it was such a different Abigail I saw like a side of her that I had pushed away or forgotten, or like a different person entirely. That was hard enough, but it was what happened next that threw everything off, tearing up my script and all my good, brave intentions. The escorting officer didn't even touch her. She would have known better than that. The kind hand was only there to usher Abigail forwards. But Abigail wrenched her arm from that kindness, with a movement so brutal that even Robert flinched, and with it every word in my throat dried up. It's all right, the officer said. 
but then she seemed to fade into the background, along with all the others in the room. D.S. McCarthy and the blurred figure of some appropriate adult. And we were there alone, the three of us, our triangle of the most complicated love. Abigail hitched the trousers she was wearing, dark purple jeans I'd never imagined for her. I was so aware of Robert beside me and the fact that he wasn't holding my hand anymore. When Abigail opened her pale, chapped lips, it felt as though my whole world stood still, and I thought to myself, here is where it all falls apart. Here is where the tidal wave comes, the force I never knew how to deal with and that I never managed to outrun. With her free hand, Abigail reached out and took the flopsy, almost idly, from my hand. So I'm going home with you now. The words were so innocuous, so exactly the opposite of what I'd been expecting. It was though a vacuum had opened up in the room, sucking out everything I'd been bracing myself against, leaving me completely at a loss as to what came next. It was only when D.S. McCarthy stepped forwards that I saw the terrible, aching mistake I had made. That was the moment, the exact moment, when I should have hugged her. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you'd like to read more, then you can find Little White Lies um, through all your normal book retailers. Enjoy the rest of the festival online and um, happy reading. Bye for now.